All right. So welcome back, everyone. Access to the metaverse is largely dependent on close to the body hardware, being headset, hand devices, etc., capable of collecting biometric and voluntary data with technologies like movement or eye tracking. This scenario amplifies the risk of privacy, autonomy, human agency, and, and our intimate thoughts are up for grabs. So where is all this going? Where is all this going to lead us? Our next panel is data surveillance, identity, and interconnected virtual worlds. Please welcome. Don't have, we have Guyane Paris, the head of data and technology, the chief digital office at the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. He leads the implementation of data strategy for UNDP, which is driving the transformation of UNDP um, into a data-driven organization and advising member states on their data, digital, and cloud strategies. Diane is also an advisor to member states in building digital public infrastructure, which includes data strategies and changes. Diane is also an expert in bringing people's voices into policy making. He has experience in digital campaigning and led, led digital campaigning and data collection and analysis effort for several global initiatives such as 75 and MyWar, bringing over 10 million voices worldwide, public and private sector partnership. Amazing, uh, let me uh, get over how amazing these profiles are. Um, Albert Foxconn is the Surveillance Technology Oversight Protection Stops founder and executive director. And if you are liking these profiles, or welcome more. And he is also a practitioner in resident at NYU Law School Information Law Institute and a fellow at the Yale Law School Information Society Project Ashoka and, and TED. Albert started Stop Believing that STOP, believing that local surveillance is an unprecedented threat to public safety, equity, and democracy. Albert previously served as an associate at Bell Ghostel and manages LLP, advising Fortune, 5, Fortune 50 companies on technology policy, antitrust law, and consumer privacy. An editorial member for the Anthem Ethics Personal Data Collection, He's also a founding member of the Imprint William Fund Advisory Council. And last but not least is with me, is moderating this panel is Kalia Young, also known as the Identity Woman, has been working on the user central digital identity for almost 20 years. She co founded the Internet Identity Workshop in 2005 consults with governments, organizations, enterprises, startups about self-sovereign identity. She is an active, she's active in decentralized identity. She's an activist in the Identity Foundation, Customer IP Foundation group collaborating with the vibrant community on open standards to create an identity there for the internet and the metaverse. So let's welcome this panel. And while you're observing this panel, you find something amazing, you can Hashtag, uh, meta, meta, hashtag metaverse safety or MSW 2022 to tweet at us or post pictures on your social media. Thank you guys. Welcoming you, Alia, over to you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Kavya. Um, welcome, everybody. This is a first for me, and I believe our other panelists too, speaking in the metaverse. It's new. Um, so we'll do our best. Um, so I wanted to open up um, the discussion with just asking our panelists to define what they what they define the metaverse to be. Uh, so let's start with you, uh, Guyan. Sure, thank you, and thank you for inviting me to this panel and. Uh, uh, so my name is Gayan Pires. I'm the, I'm the head of data and technology for UN Development Program. And uh, what Metaverse means to us is actually, um, for me personally, it's 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 a space for opportunities. Uh, and uh, I'm pretty sure we are at the at the very early stages now, and the potential of this is is massive, which is why it is very important for us to get this right and not to repeat the same mistakes we've done uh, with the internet 
uh, therefore in the in the coming um, uh, in, in the coming uh, minutes, uh, we will we will we will discuss about uh, what should we do about it, and uh, what UN is doing about it, and what UNDP specifically is doing about it. Cool. Thanks, Albert. Yes, and uh, I hope everyone can hear me okay. It's always uh, a bit nerve-wracking when you do uh, an event in a, in a new medium. But no, I, for me, the metaverse is always an evolving term. Uh, I always have thought of it as sort of a placeholder for where technology is going to be in five to ten years. It's something that isn't yet mainstream, but is going to, in the relatively near term, something that intermediates between us and the physical world. So for example, if you had talked to me about the ways that people navigate New York City today, constantly in their own audio bubble, you know, with uh, AirPods uh, and other headphones, you know, selectively tuning out the world around them with different forms of, you know, uh, I personally will go from noise cancellation to transparency mode, depending on the setting. That would have seemed like a facet of a metaverse environment. Today, I think a lot of it is about a lot of what we're discussing is virtual reality, augmented reality, and the ways that we'll see visual uh, uh, our, our visual perception of the world being altered by technology. But it really is a moving target. And, and so I, I don't think, you know, the metaverse for me is ever going to be a discrete static set of technologies, but it's always going to be this sort of way of referring to the technologies that in the near future are going to be expanding interconnectivity and potentially creating a barrier between us and the offline uh, world. Great, thank you. Um, and our other panelist, Stefan, is doing his best to come back and join us because I think in our preparation for this panel, he had some really interesting things to share. So, um, <clears throat> so one of the key things that we're here to discuss is risks to human agency. Um, so when you think about how data is collected, shared, and used in the metaverse, what are the risks that um, that are in play for how how those interactions will impact our human agency? Thanks for that question. Uh, yeah, so just to go back to uh, fundamentals of uh, what we are doing now, in fact, uh, just for the audience, for we are, the agency I work for is UN's uh, development program, just to be, give you a bit of context on, on my answer. And uh, we are present in uh, over uh, we are present in over 170 countries working on development issues. And we have uh, our signature offerings, as we call it, in, in governance, uh, resilience, energy, climate change, and uh, gender equality. And we also have a digital strategy, like you mentioned before, uh, where we support governments in their digital journey as well. And more and more, we are now getting involved in building digital public infrastructure for governments. And, and in their digital journey, think about this as your railroads or, uh, or your roads where, or electricity, where you build that public infrastructure for that innovation ecosystem to, to thrive. And, in, in this, we operate at the, at the policy level, bringing in, taking a human rights based approach, uh, bringing in policies to govern data to in order to make sure privacy is not an afterthought when you design these digital ecosystems, but it is it is embedded in the design itself. And uh, we in the countries we work in, work in from our vantage point, we see many challenges starting from the very basic level of people seeing data as a technical thing. Oh, that's something technical. Let's talk to IT department about it. Uh, fr from that to not to understand people, general public, not understanding what data privacy at all. So you can imagine how these problems amplify uh, with metaverse as well. And one of the common problems with technologies like metaverse and AI is uh, people thinking, well, this is this is te technology for, you know, that's going to come in another five years or 10 years, not realizing it is now. And, and, and our approach should be inclusive, bringing the whole of society to the discussion right now 
so our values are reflected in in this metaverse that uh, that we are building so when it comes to data privacy it's the same problems that exist in the digital world that will exist in metaverse as well and we will have the problems that we have not foreseen uh, because we are at a very early stage in in this uh, especially in terms of devices um, in terms of wearable uh, technology when when they start communicating with the metaverse so uh, i think from a from a uh, from our perspective, what we need to focus on getting those frameworks right at the at the beginning, ensuring that people are at the center of it and human rights are at the center of it uh, when we design these policies. With, uh, with them. I think that is bringing to the table with the XRSI work is really trying to bring the whole of society to the table to discuss these issues. So Albert, um, how do you see the impact of the metaverse on human agency, um, both in sort of VR, but also in augmented reality? Well, as the resident uh, privacy activist slash Luddite slash uh, uh, person who's read di m far too many dystopian sci-fi novels, I, I think that I'm really concerned about the piece of data capture and the lack of regulation that meaningfully prevents abuse both by private sector and public sector actors. So in the American context, it's, it's the Wild West. We largely are relying on self-governance by corporations in how they collect data and how they're uh, using it, it you know, in the metaverse context. For example, when we look at augmented reality, uh, 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 and particularly in my organization, we look at police uses of it, there are effectively no laws governing how you know, augmented reality can be used outside of the home. So if a police officer wants to put on AR goggles and use facial recognition to identify every single person they pass on the street, that's legal in almost every city and state in the U.S., if they want to run an instant background check anytime they meet someone that that's also going to be legal. And so you can see this capacity for augmented reality to fundamentally change the relationship between individuals and the state by you know, allowing for this you know, disintermediation of, of our uh, just human interaction. You know, essentially, you're going to create this level, this layer of data collection, data analytics, but you know, in real world contexts where we've never had to worry about that. And meanwhile, when it comes to data collection on virtual reality platforms, I'm really concerned about the ways that we're essentially baking surveillance into the products, not just surveillance of you know users' biometric data when you're, they're using wearables and headsets, but also I, I'm quite concerned about the ways that you know, since virtual reality is so rooted in gaming and gaming has such a long history of trying to prioritize, you know, child welfare through um, surveillance of user activity, to the extent we're living our lives online in the metaverse, in virtual reality environments in the future, we're, we're largely baking in norms that prioritize, you know, surveillance, centralized control, and, and things that we simply wouldn't accept in, in in our uh everyday lives and so you know at, at uh, my organization at stop the surveillance technology oversight project we've been trying to think through what should the rules of the road be for how a allowed to collect this data and what should be the limitations both on a policy level and on a legislative level because you know we we really are are quite concerned that you know just to agree with the prior remarks you know if we are on the verge of recreating a lot of the mistakes that were made with you know earlier eras of internet governance and and we want to make sure we don't accelerate that sort of surveillance capitalism and surveillance state. Thank you. Um, that's a great perspective that you're bringing. Um, I'll just um, share some of my own um, thoughts. 
as Stefan isn't up here yet, um, but I still remember the first time that I um, saw a Magic Leap headset and put it on and the person and I interacted with it for like two minutes and I was like, this is too weird. But the person who introduced me to it was explaining how much data these headsets collect and how intimate it is. And that how most of the companies who were exploring, implementing and using these technologies had no answer to the question of where does the data go? How is it stored? How is it <clears throat> saved? You know, like your experience can get better if these systems know you better. But where is that data stored in between sessions and how is it yours instead of the companies that you're or the platforms that you're interacting with? And these questions really haven't been dealt with particularly well. I know with my community digital identity, there's a subsection of our community focused on personal data and personal data stores and potentially building new um new types of services that host individual data that they could use to store data from their metaverse interactions and then come back and and connect it again but but that's all still to be determined because everything's so new um so thinking about um how um the the metaverse can play a role in global development and um you know like what's the intersection between um how can help global development um and, and you know touching back to these themes how is how is that um what are the risks as well at the same time in terms of how people and data are treated in that process Diane. Yes, uh, so uh, in terms of uh, how how this intersects with de intersects with development, uh, we can uh, we can already see the benefits, especially in the space of learning, like how uh, how um, metaverse is used for educational and learning experiences, and also improving the the there there will be new economic opportunities opening up in uh, in in the metaverse and also uh, new services new ways to uh, to operate businesses and and we've already seen businesses drafting strategies towards how they approach metaverse whether it's whether they are even selling a physical product right now how can you augment that and also um, it's a, it's another area to boost citizens engagement as well and uh, also I mean, think about the spectrum of issues that we are talking about. Even when we started, like I'm talking about at a very basic level of uh, understanding of data to actually we are talking about the understanding of the metaverse. So uh, so bringing this knowledge to people uh, is is the biggest factor in, in development. And also uh, we need to ensure that uh, one of the biggest risk of this is, is the underlying data and also uh, there are structural risk as well as we know 2.7 billion people still don't have access to internet so event and also uh, people who are marginalized who are who haven't uh, we, we haven't considered in the conversation as we develop metaverse as we go on this journey eventually when they join they they cannot be once again an afterthought like oh we didn't think about them at the beginning so how can they have a seat at the table if they don't even have connectivity to join right now uh, is an issue we need to ensure that we represent those people with uh, in, in the conversations we are having uh, and also uh, when it comes to data protection or even though the technology is different, even though metaverse is very new and we are going in directions that we haven't seen in the in the past, it is important we get the fundamentals and we build on build the metaverse on the values that we believe. Uh, that is putting human rights at the center and inclusion at the at the center of it, and having the proper frameworks like Albert said earlier. Let's not let's not re repeat the mistakes we've done with the internet. Let's ensure it can be used for development as well. So a follow-up is like, how do we make it safe? Yes, uh, the first thing is uh, 
to make something safe, first thing is to understand how it works as well. Uh, I know, especially this part of the world, at least they have an idea of what uh, what metaverse is and what does it mean when it comes to, especially when it comes to uh, um, data protection and uh, online uh, online interactions. But in certain parts of the world, they don't even understand what metaverse is. So uh, metaverse safety is is a such is, is such a distant subject for them. So I, I guess the first step here is that awareness building on uh, why this matters, why this is not something, uh, don't look at this uh, like the first person who looked at a cell phone and, and thought uh, this is a completely useless device. And said, look past uh, the hardware, look past uh, what is there right now, look at the potential, but at the same time, uh, ensure that data governance frameworks are, are, are built uh, the the necessary regulation and, and uh, reg legislation frameworks are built uh, for metaverse uh, before it gets too far ahead. So we know what we are doing here. And also, let's talk about the interoperability as well. So no one company gets advantage over the others. Right. This is uh, interoperability is a great question that I'm a big fan of discussing, but that isn't exactly the topic we're here for right now. Um, I wanted to channel a little bit of what Stefan would have brought to this panel, and he was talking, he's focused, he's at the Cyber Peace Building Institute, and he's focused on cybersecurity. And one of the things that he raised to me that I hadn't thought of was what he called cognitive security. So real-time date, like with a mounted headset that's, that's, feeding information to our eyes and to our ears and potentially also haptics, that cyber attacks and kind of um, the way that we could be impacted by cybersecurity breaches goes beyond just what we might see on a screen that we can close down, but that could impact how, like it's much closer to us with these devices on. And, and and impacting our body and our senses in ways that regular cybersecurity issues are not. So that was something that just really made me think and I wanted to make sure to raise and share with you guys here since he wasn't able to deal with his hardware issues to get on stage. Um, so Albert, um, one of the things um, you um, raised or talked about was um, about speech moderation. Um, you touched on it a little bit, but um, how do um, how does us being in the metaverse in a on a platform that is um, capable of seeing what's happening on it um, increase risks around? Um, Speech. Yeah, happy to talk about that. And, you know, we've um, done quite a bit of work uh, in the past looking at the need to retain encryption and true end to end encryption with user controlled uh, encryption keys on a lot of traditional uh, communications platforms, everything from Signal and WhatsApp to you know the most recent push by Apple to expand encryption on iCloud and uh, a lot of its services. And when I look at a lot of um, you know, metaverse platforms, I'm really concerned that none of what we're doing right now is encrypted. None of what we're doing in this, you know, virtual room, whether it's a private message or a broadcast to the whole group, has any sort of protection from monitoring. And quite the reverse, we see only growing pressure to build that sort of centralized monitoring into these platforms. And I, I think this is something that ha has been just part of the accepted practice in, you know, virtual reality um, systems, you know, since uh, for as long as we've had networked VR, just because so much of it was used for gaming. And, and so I, I just want to, you know, raise the, alarm a, a, a bit that we or 
really pose a you know, an existential threat to democracy as we know it, whether it's access to abortion care or communication about political dissent or religious freedom. Every aspect of democratic life that we want to foster in, you know, physical spaces, well, if we want the metaverse to actually bring out the best of our society instead of just amplifying the worst, we we should leave the protections in place to foster that sort of political activity, that sort of religious activity, that sort of access to you know confidential information. But right now none of that is being protected. And you know, especially in America where we see growing emphasis by police on using corporate information as a policing tool. Uh, particularly, you know, communications from social media. There's a huge, uh, there, there, there's a huge risk that these sorts of, um, you know, uh, content moderation practices, the ability to monitor everything said on the platform, is going to put people at risk on the governmental side. And then there's the whole other hornet's nest of, well, how do we decide what speech and what activity and what movements are permissible in the metaverse? I mean, it's hard enough, as we've seen with Twitter, for example, it's hard enough just to agree about what text is permissible on a website. But when you look at more and more of your life being led in a digital space, the question of what activity is permissible on that space becomes increasingly hard. And I don't think we have any real agreement at either at a governmental level or in the public on what what the rules of the road should look like for how we are allowed to interact uh, with each other in, in these spaces. So I think a lot of unanswered questions and I think a lot of risks uh, if we don't take action to, again, put privacy protections into place that allow people to really you know, communicate with uh, confidence. So um, I... I think you raise a lot of great questions and issues and, and part of them hopefully are going to be addressed by government and they're uh, at least the ones aligned with democracy and freedom of speech or speech rights in terms of the ability to have private communications. Um, Guyan, do you have any thoughts about how some of these issues can be addressed? Um, via your work at the UNDP and with the governments that you're working with? Yeah, it's a tough question, in fact, because uh, right now, the, the whole understanding of it and also uh, the type of profiles that, that will appear on Metaverse as well. For example, uh, I have my official profile for, for this and I would also have a personal profile uh, as well. And also uh, this is an area consistently evolving as well. So it, our, our job as the UN is to, to ensure that we bring everyone to the table. Uh, we take an inclusive approach in, in what we do and get people involved in this conversation, not on the peripherals of it, but at least uh, in, the, in the midst of it too. So they understand the impact that will have uh, on their day-to-day -day lives, on, on their businesses. Uh, and having those discussions, having discussions in a base uh, is the way forward because we still don't know the full potential. I'm pretty sure this will be used in, in uh, Metaverse will be used in uh, for things that we don't even imagine uh, right now. Great. Um, so I'd like to actually, I'm not totally sure how this works in the metaverse, but we'll try it out. I'd love to invite the audience to ask questions. Um, do they raise their, I guess, Whatever. Raising hands seems hard when you are coming into this space without little hands tools. You're just in. Um... Well, there's a raise hand feature on the lower right hand corner. Oh, there is a raise hand feature. Okay, great. Oh, Kavi is moving around. Yes. And hey, I want to help you guys. Ask a question, raise your hands, and 
we will make sure you have the floor for your questions based on the questions of Fabia and the MC. Yeah, hey guys, can you hear me? I'm going to help you with the question and answer moderation, if that's okay. Elia? Great. Awesome. So I think we have a hand raised. It was Sam who raised a hand. Sam, I want to ask a question. Could you please raise your hand one more time and megaphone you in? Click on hand raise. And in the meantime, you know, guys, since I have the opportunity to speak to you and Kalia, if you want to, while we're not talking, maybe uh, mute, it would be, it would be able to clear the audio a bit more for audience. So I was really, really curious about the UND response as well. And, you know, so going on this current domain, so many competing priorities on the other side of this war, there's a war going on. And I was there in the NATO HQ just last month. And so how are we going to actually, like in concrete sense, are we going to do But how are we to, you, you have any guidance on how can we engage with the rest of the world? Um, and not just like one organization, but bring, bring a lot more people to this attention that, hey, there is a tide turning, your internet is coming, it's immersive. How can we help this? Do you have any guidance? You know so much more about these government building. Uh, you were breaking out a little bit, but I can. I think I can. Uh, I, I I understand the question, and and yes, uh, there are so many conflicting priorities right now. Uh, once again, from one spectrum, uh, one one end of the spectrum, spectrum to the other, but it is important we have this conversation right here, right now as well, and uh, uh, not to push this as as a future issue because this is among us right now, and uh, it is very important to get it. Uh, Get it right right now. So uh, one of the ways to get keep keep involved is uh, we as an agency UNDP is uh, uh, you go to um, UNDP.org/digital and you can see many ways you can get involved with uh, with us through forums like this, uh, through providing your expertise into into the conversations that are happening, providing your perspectives into uh, into uh, the conversations that are happening. You don't have to be a metaverse expert to uh, to bring your perspective. You can tell us about some of the practical problems that you're having, and it could be something very rudimentary as get, I don't even have access to the internet, basically. How can I talk about metaverse? And, and that's a conversation starter. Uh, for the for the experts around the world as well, how can we how can we how can we bridge that gap and not further uh, widen the digital divide in the world? So, getting involved in the conversation, uh, uh, forums like this, and in getting involved in uh, UNDP and UN uh, in general is the way to go. And and in my in your in the introduction, uh, I'll mention I I had a few. Uh, I had some experience with bringing people's voices into into the UN. Don't think of UN as this big organization. Just work with governments on on the political issues. UN is 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 actually you. Uh, we represent people, and we want your voice heard uh, at the highest levels. So please get engaged with us. Uh, like I said, you don't have to be a, an expert in any particular subject. Just tell us how you feel, what you want, and that should be reflected in the policies that we make. I mean, you just have to be human to get engaged with any subject. That is remarkable. And thank you. And I see that our previous participant, um, and actually the upcoming speaker, Sam, uh, has a question. Sam, you're backed up. Do uh, you want to ask a question? Sure, yeah. Hey, th thank you for that. I'm just in the tools like everyone else trying to figure out if uh, <laughs> I've managed to raise my hand successfully. Um, hey, this is this is really interesting. I'm particularly kind of curious about some of the more specific things that got raised. Kalia, you sort of brought in the uh, perspective of the other person who couldn't make it into the panel. I think it's really illustrative, I think, of just the vast sort of vectors 
for which uh, privacy and fundamental human rights need to be protected against. So um, it's, it's pretty easy to see the breadth of challenges that we face. But I'm particularly curious too as to what tangible kind of baby steps you feel we could take. I mean, there are a lot of conversations about data unions, for example. Um, would, would you see any practical proposals that you think as a community we can come around to begin to yeah make some progress in these areas and, and to echo Guyana, I guess the reality is um, we, we can make some of these steps together and uh, make practical kind of you know momentum. So yeah, um, quite tangibly, I mean, data unions, do you see something like that being useful or there are there specific things you think we can uh, start on? Thanks. Yeah, I think data unions are really interesting as a starting point. They seem, I think they kind of emerged around the time that Google was talking about standing up sidewalk labs in Toronto and sort of how does how did all the data generated in the physical area of the sidewalk labs real world city that was highly censored and wired up. So we could think of like that as like a physical version of what we all experience in the metaverse with the amount of censoring and sense sensors that are in the metaverse environment. Um, but it's always seemed like a kind of way for a giant corporation to get away with collecting a lot of data and going, oh, well, it's in a data union and there's a data trust board that's going to protect us from the corporation somehow. And I was always, I, I still think it's worth exploring that as a potential path, but it seems a cop out in terms of how individuals get back their data. Um, there's a gentleman in my community named Johannes Ernst leading um, an effort to build data palaces for people to collect all the data that they've generated so far in their digital lives from the last 10 plus years on Facebook, Twitter, their Amazon purchase history, their LinkedIn interactions. Like we've all, those of us who've been active participants in web two have generated a lot of data in that world. And how do we collect it back for ourselves before we think about pooling it into pools that corporations can do stuff with. And a different question is how do we pool it in a public goods kind of oriented way? I know that um, there's been a, a movement around digital public goods. Um, I actually think it would be great if Guyon could touch on that kind of work and 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 respond to the question as well in terms of what how do we are data unions a good path forward to address some of these challenges. Yes, uh, in fact, uh, we are part of the Digital Public Goods uh, Goods Alliance. UNDP is uh, part of the Digital Public Goods Alliance, uh, uh, bringing in uh, reusable, scalable code, um, not just code, uh, in certain cases, data and uh, AI algorithms as well, where you can use, anyone can go into Digital Public, just uh, look up for Google Digital Public Goods Alliance, and, and you can see the, the type of things that's, uh, that's available for, for common good. There and I think uh, for for things like for the question Sam raised uh, for things like um, data data unions and data trust, it's you need to ensure the economic value of data. It's going to be used. Um, I would say data has to be used to 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 bring the real market value. But having said that, you cannot simply it it cannot be the wild west. It needs to be governed and and just getting consent from users is not enough. And as you know, you are, no one is going to read the, a 20, 32 page document uh, uh, on how your data is going to be used. So having those trusted authorities is important, but more, it's more important that the economic value of your data is distributed evenly as well uh, and not create yet another the monopoly in, in who gets benefits out of uh, data if you create data trust. So um, uh, ensuring uh, I, like you said, uh, Sam, how some of those baby steps, uh, uh, I think in terms of baby steps, the first step is because of the cross-border nature of, uh, of metaverse and cross-border nature of data as well, 
uh, first step is establishing frameworks uh, and value value driven frameworks value based frameworks uh, in how do we manage data one thing consistently comes up is is data whether you're talking about metaverse ai digital or or any business these days the, the at the core of it is data so ensuring we have those frameworks we have regulatory frameworks and uh, policies to govern our data properly which then has that effect uh, when it comes to metaverse when it comes to the data trust and unions that uh, gives the value back to users Albert, do you want to add to that yeah, and uh, unsurprisingly, I, I'm one of the folks who's been slightly skeptical about data unions as a way to meaningfully address some of the uh, broader privacy and autonomy concerns that come from surveillance capitalism and broad-based data collection. I think partly that's because I, I, I think a lot of the work on data unions has primarily been looking at economic value um, from data collection, but as you know, a civil rights lawyer, as someone who you know oftentimes deals with questions around uh, the ways that mass data collection enables deportation, uh, enables uh, you know policing, enables all of these you know abuses by the government. Well, data unions don't really address that. Uh, and a lot of these questions around data monetization don't address the full array of, you know, concerns that come when all of these intimate, you know, details about our lives are collected. So instead, I, I, I focus traditionally on, you know, two things. One is just, you know, the familiar privacy by design principles that a lot of us already know from, you know, traditional, uh, you know, forms of, uh, you know, uh, engineering, you know, that you should not be collecting massive amounts of information that you don't need. You shouldn't be warehousing information proactively. You should have pr proportional safeguards and all of those sorts of things. But then the other thing I, I've been focusing on is this uh, idea of legal firewalls, which is um, a concept that, you know, we can have legal protections that prevent uh, data that's been collected from by private corporations from being misused by public agencies. And that's something that we've seen a little bit of here in the US with uh, legislation we, we're working on in um, New York that would prevent uh, police from purchasing our information from companies and using it as a policing tool without a warrant. But I think that we need much more robust safeguards just to ensure that you know when companies have this data that it isn't you know up for the highest bidder in government and that also isn't just one court order away from being used as a tool for policing or immigration enforcement that is such an important point thank you sir oh. i see someone at the mic but i don't know if that means they want to speak yes Halim. i think let's take a question from Halim, who's patiently waiting racist and for a while. Go for it, you're mic'd up. And unmute yourself. Can't actually hear you, Helene. I know that you are mic'd up. Just need to unmute yourself if you're able to. Thank you. And if I may, you know, while we are waiting for you to sort of fix the like issues, Albert, about this data, um, the surveillance uh, question, there is something about these experiences impossible to create without the collection of data. In fact, without the real time of data. But I'm a big proponent of this technology, and I'm saying, hey, we need the data. So then, where is this fine line between creating a surveillance state, which, you know, we're kind of inching towards it already, and then letting, allowing this data, because we don't have it, we don't have a federal privacy law. We have so many challenges. So someone like you who's 
an activist, like where is this timeline? How do we how do we establish this boundary, this safeguard? There is a legal. But then do you think that this responsibility should be so clear on the corporations as well? Because governments are gonna want, want the evidence there is a crime that occurs. And if there is data supporting that crime, uh, or providing evidence bring the warrant and then what? Like what are we to do in those kinds of contexts? Where is this time? Any any impact yeah, it, I think it's a, a really difficult question for a lot of companies to answer. And, you know, when I was a corporate lawyer and advising companies, we would uh, talk a lot about where the legal lines were on um, data retention and compliance with a, a court order. But I think there are companies that are doing business in this environment you know, they also have a long-term interest in preventing this sort of co-option of by their platforms. You know, if, you know, you are routinely providing your users' data to police to be used against them, particularly in an environment where that can mean, you know, uh, law enforcement efforts, not just to target abortion and not just protest, but even healthcare for, you know, gender affirming healthcare for trans youth. There's so many areas of life here in the US where, you know, everyday life and essential parts of life are under attack by, you know, highly politicized and polarized state uh, officials that if you're building a technology platform that is collecting huge sums of data in that environment, you have to have a plan for how you protect folks. So partly that can mean, you know, helping those of us who are advocating on the ground for these legal firewalls. Part of that is really reevaluating what type of data collection and uh, preservation is necessary to deliver your product. I mean, maybe, yes, you, you know, with a lot of these platforms, huge amounts of data uh, needs to be recorded in the first instance, but how long do you actually need to retain it? How long, you know, maybe it's useful for a product development standpoint to have the last 30 days of data, but do you actually need to warehouse, you know, user interactions for, you know, months and even years as some companies do? Uh, and also just, you know, building in privacy protective features. I mean, there is nothing to stop a lot of platforms from introducing encrypted, you know, logless chats today, from introducing, you know, the the signal of, you know, virtual reality today. But companies simply have chosen in many cases not to introduce that as part of their model. And I hope that's something that, you know, I hope it won't take you know, the sort of arrests we've seen using Facebook and other social media to to really prod VR companies to, to follow suit. Right. And that that, that really agrees into another online question. Because, you know, some of this we even fall back onto things that Kalia has been advocating for decades. And that's what, you know, Kalia, it's an online question from online uh, is, what is so unique about like, and how now in the front end and in the back end? Like, please recommend to us as we are assembled here. What do we need to do in Word, in augmented or virtual, whatever? But in the back end, also, there's a lot going on that could potentially lead to yes, you can have the data, but protect it. You have something there, you know, you, you have great insights with your, your yeah. years of experience. This is a really excellent question. So I think it's both different and the same, and I think we need it to be different in the future. So by what I mean by the same is that to get onto this platform here today, I had to have a Microsoft ID. That is a name, you know, happens to be identitywomen at hotmail.com. I had to have a name in the, um, a namespace controlled by Microsoft that they recognized. 
And that's sort of how things have operated in Web 2.0 for the last dozen years. And even before that, when we had the pre-Web world, when you had your AOL account, you had a handle in AOL namespace, right? And what we can now do, thanks to some of the open standards that my folks in communities I help lead have been working on, and, and Gaia, Gaia actually mentioned open standards as a critical forward-looking component of the metaverse, um, is there are now open standards where I can bring a digital identifier with me into digital space, and folks are working on how I could potentially also bring my avatar how I look in in a 3D world with me between different worlds owned by different plat, you know, different companies, or even hopefully some of them will be not owned by companies but managed and, and, and stewarded by communities, that we are on the cusp of being able to take our digital representations of ourselves with us between platforms and not have those anchored to corporations or, you know, in some instances anchored to government, I, uh, government controlled identifiers that, um, so so we're on the cusp of that, that the technologies that um, we kind of lump them all together called self-sovereign identity or decentralized identity. Um, it's still probably, you know, a year, year and a half away, but I know there's one company, Disco XYZ, that's specifically focused on how to bridge these technologies into the metaverse. And I'm really looking to forward to seeing what their product looks like and how other companies can adopt these tools to empower individuals. So uh, if you care about that, you're welcome to join us in the forums that um, we're discussing those, like the Internet Identity Workshop that was mentioned in my introduction and places like the Decentralized Identity Foundation. Great, thank you so much. Your insights are going to shape the way we actually control and move our identity force and safeguard them. I think we can now hear from, do you, do you wanna try Helene, your question? Uh, yeah, if you could click your hand raise one more time, I'm going to the microphone. Okay, you should be on air. Yeah. And it's really hard to hear you, so maybe you can close to the stage and speak and I can redo your question. Fortunately, even with the mic, it's hard to... It sounds like yeah. you your you might be a far away from your mic in physical space. I don't know. Yeah. Do you want to come close to the stage, Halim, and speak? Because then that way we maybe hear you better. There we go. Okay. Now we can try. I'm going to finish up now. Oh. I'm so sorry that you're not able to. Okay, no worries. Okay, now actually we can hear you now. Just heard you. Okay, great. Fantastic. So um, what I was trying to say is uh, thank you for the very exciting um, discussion. I have three questions for the three panelists, um, but um, we have they're... time for just we have time until twelve forty-five. You've got three minutes, so you have okay. to wrap it. <laughs> okay, so Sorry about general. That. Okay, so, so I'll just do a general question, and please, anyone, feel free to jump in. But like, what are the um, most prominent um, challenges um, that you see in terms of? Uh, continuity um, and and maintaining identities across um, across the, the mixed realities that the metaverse is hopefully going to lead to in terms of data, uh, in terms of um, the the identity aspect and how people maintain their identity, and finally in terms of surveillance. 
Um, I'm just really interested in the in the continuity aspect of it, um, and how are we going to manage that um, basically in in the coming uh, future, which is hopefully not going to be too far away. <laughs> Seems like you kind of uh, presented the track of the panel. That's what the whole panel is about. But, but I, let's do this. How about closing thoughts? For I, each I, have one a, of you? I have a really quick answer is we need personal data source and we need simple interfaces for them and we need people to demand them from corporations. How about you, Gayan? Closing yes, thoughts. just on that uh, last thought, like we need people to demand for that cooperation. We need, uh, we thought, we talked a lot about oversight. In fact, we need accountability as well. People should demand for that accountability from, from these corporations. Uh, this should be built for people, not the other way around. I'm with you and Albert. Yeah, I think uh, activism, public pressure, and then just, you know, we're, we're starting to see more laws uh, that actually address some of these issues and having greater uh, protections, particularly at the state level here in the U.S. will do a lot. But I, I think for me, the right to remain anonymous in a lot of spaces is indispensable to having an Internet that's free for all. And so that's going to be one of the real um, concerns about the, the coming wave of uh, Metaverse products. Thank you so much, Leah. So shall we call it a wrap? Uh, I hope this experience has helped, to, helped to <laughs> gain deeper insight into how intrusive the ecosystem already is. I'll be right with. I can't thank you all enough. Thank anyway. you. Virtual reality show desktop a platform and uh, thank you albert thank you kalia and let's take five minutes break and then we'll reset this space as well and then we'll be back again with another speaker from undp at a sam Ng. and uh yeah thank you all